So, so uh, I, I'm I'm going to be as eager as a, a participant as, as all of you. We have a significant list of things uh, to get through that have come in from you. So thank you very much. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then they're going to give a short introduction uh, to their area of expertise, and then we're going to get into uh, our questions. So in order, uh, uh, our speakers are going to speak to us this morning. Um, we have Jackie Fox, who is Managing Director of Accenture. We have Brian Holman, who is the MD of uh, BH Consultancy. We have Donna O'Shea, who's the chair of uh, Cyber in Cork Institute of Technology. We have the head of the National Cyber Crime Bureau, Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Cleary, who many of you will have seen on the media. And we uh, also have Detective uh, Superintendent Pat Ryan. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, kick them off immediately now for uh, their uh, short contributions, and then we will move into your questions. So without further ado, uh, I'll ask uh, um, Maeve if she could um, unmute Jackie Fox, and I'll hand you over to Jackie Fox. Good morning, everybody, um, and thank you very much for having me here to speak to everyone this morning. Uh, my name is Jackie Fox, and I look after security for Accenture in Ireland. The, uh, um, I suppose what I spend my days doing is helping people to try and secure their networks and also helping them after they've had some kind of an issue. And I don't um, really, you know, kind of, I, I don't envy small businesses because you have a very tough task. Um, you have the same uh, cybercrime issues going on uh, that larger businesses with bigger budgets have, um, but you have a much smaller budget and it is harder for you to apportion it and how you actually spend it. Um, so my advice to you in short would be, um, Try and understand what you have that might be valuable to cyber criminals and also what's valuable to you and make sure that you try and protect the things that you value. Um, and that might be that, you know, you train your staff to say, you know, don't send out things to random people who ask you for them. Um, or it might be that you say, well, I, we have a piece of really important intellectual property in our business, so we're going to really care for that and, and make sure that it doesn't pass over our perimeters or move around our network unless we've given it permission to do so. Um, the other small things that I would say to you is make sure that you back up the things that you know you value um, and that you've got plans in place for if something happens to them. How do you reconstitute them and, and, and make them work again? Um, we all know about some of the threats that are around today about ransomware and espionage. Um, but and it's harder to think about this in a small business, but don't forget about the insider threat. You know, um, these aren't the criminal and the nation state that are trying to get into your business, but somebody inside who might be disgruntled or they've fallen on hard times. And I would say a lot of the investigations I've done over the years into small and medium enterprises has been from somebody leaving and bringing a customer database with them or some kind of intellectual property with them. So much and all of that's harder to think about where, you know, you're probably know your staff and the people you work with a lot better than in a larger organization. It is very important to try and protect yourself against that. Um, so that, that's in a nutshell uh, what I'd like to kind of uh, try and bring out in the discussions today. Thank you, Neil. Thanks very much, uh, Jackie. <clears throat> uh, without further ado, I'll ask Brian Holman, uh, MD of BH Consult, to join us. Thanks, Neil, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Honan. I'm CEO of BH, BH Consulting. Uh, similar to Neil and probably a lot of you on this call, I'm an owner of a, an SME as well. We've got uh, just under 25 staff here, so I can appreciate the challenges many of you have with regards to protecting your businesses and keeping them secure. Uh, Jackie has hit quite a lot of the, the key points that uh, as an SME owner, we, we face the same threats as the banks and the large organizations, but unfortunately we don't have the same resources. Now, I'm not saying that's a, a reason to give up hope or, or anything like that, but uh, if, if there are a lot of basic steps that we can, we can follow, Jackie mentioned backups, keeping your systems uh, up to date, uh, with, patched with software, keeping your uh, antivirus software up to date are probably key steps to uh, protecting your systems. 
The other one I would suggest is making sure staff are aware of the responsibilities and of the threats regards cybersecurity and that they uh, are know how to uh, select and use secure passwords and where you can that you implement what's called two-step verification or multi-factor authentication on uh, key accounts such as email or uh, uh, remote VPN and remote access, et cetera. And that's to add extra steps into the, the, the login process. Uh, the threats we've seen as uh, consultants working with our clients, uh, particularly the SME sector, uh, are ransomware. It's also uh, email accounts being hijacked and uh, it's invoice payment redirection fraud. Neil, Neil talked about some of those emails you're getting in and demanding payment, et cetera. So uh, that, they're the key things you need to look at. Uh, and just to reiterate what Jackie said as well, uh, cybercrime used to be a IT problem. It was the nerds who had to worry about cybercrime. I think what's happening today, we can all see from the HSC attack, et cetera, uh, cybercrime is a business issue. It can impact your organization uh, negatively and, and have a major impact on your organization. And therefore, cybercrime and cybersecurity should be treated as a key business risk in your organization and you should be managing this risk the same way you're managing any other risks in your organization. So uh, hopefully through, through, throughout the next hour or so, we can get some more uh, good details and information for you as well. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brian. And uh, just to our participants, Brian has put up a link uh, to a European um, uh, uh, source of information on this. So you'll get that within the chat box if you just go in and copy and paste it into your browser. Um, I'm now going to call on Donna O'Shea, who I, I did say uh, is from Cork Institute of Technology. I may have misspoken and I should be now calling you from Munster Technical University. But uh, Donna, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, CIT no longer exists as a legal <laughs> entity, so it's a multi technological university. But um, thanks very much, uh, Neil, for this invitation today. Um, my name is uh, Donna O'Shea, and I hold the position chair of cybersecurity at MTU. Um, I suppose I'm, I lead a number of initiatives in research and skills. Um, I'm a PI in an SFI research center called Confirm, and I'm also an FI in another SFI research center called Connect. And I lead a nationally funded project um, by the HEA, um, which is about an 8.1 million project called CyberSkills, which is a collaborative project with the leading universities across Ireland who are delivering on cybersecurity skills needs, um, including MTU is the lead, UL, TU Dublin, and also UCD. Um, and together, by working together, we're, we're, we're trying to respond to industry needs in terms of cybersecurity skills. Um, I guess the, what I want to talk about briefly is the fact that, you know, over the past 18, 24 months, um, a lot of companies have been coming to us, big and small companies. And, you know, they've been um, facing significant challenges, you know, they've had to go online, um, you know, the digitalization strategy has advanced significantly over the past uh, two years. Um, overall, digitalization and the adoption of digitalization has advanced significantly globally. Um, and, you know, we're also in a situation where we have employees that reside outside the network perimeter. There actually is no perimeter anymore. So we're, we're dealing in a perimeterless environment. Um, there's also problems with VPNs. Um, VPNs only connect people to the networks. They don't actually connect people to applications. Um, and then we also have this issue where people are using more cloud-based services and companies are coming to us and they're looking at how to address the challenges in this very, very complicated um, uh, landscape. Um, and mainly the people who are coming to us are, are there are a lot of multinationals. And then we have SMEs coming to us as well, and they're looking for a completely different range of cybersecurity services. Um, and in response to their needs, um, we submitted an application under the EI equipment call um, there a few months ago, and we were successful in obtaining funding for um, a cyber range, a mobile cyber range, and we have um, completed the tendering process for that cyber range now, so we can, we can announce that Airbus was successful in that cyber range. Um, and what we're going to be doing now over the next few months is we're going to be developing R&D services, specialized R&D services for SMEs um, based on their needs. Um, so we'll be able to do on-site penetration testing, security assurance testing, and we've also hired someone to actually work in the cyber range and to work with um, these SMEs and, and understand what their needs are. 
Um, and this is the first to kind, kind of the country and, and we're hoping to roll this out very, very soon. Um, in addition to that, I just want to talk briefly about uh, skills um, and the cyber skills project that I'm, that, that I'm leading nationally. Um, we want to work with SMEs, um, we want to work with all different types of industries, and we want to create innovative enterprise focus and research informed cybersecurity courses. Um, the type of companies that have come to us to date are, have been multinationals. They have, the, they have had the largest voice. And I think it's really a call for action for SMEs today to come to us and tell us what do you need in terms of cybersecurity skills needs, because we want to respond to all different types of industry sectors and not just one particular type, because that's what we've been given the funding to do. So it's really just a call to SMEs um, to tell us what you want um, and to tell us how you want it to deliver it. And there's an opportunity here for you to shape the way that cybersecurity education is going to be delivered in the future in Ireland. Thank you. That's great, Donna. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and now from the investigation, uh, detection and, and prosecution side, we're delighted to have uh, members of the uh, National um, Cyber uh, Crime Bureau from Angarda Siakana. And to start, I'm going to ask uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Cleary to brief us. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Cleary. I'm the Detective Chief Superintendent in charge of the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau. Uh, I'm delighted to be here this morning, and I'm delighted that my bureau is participating in this webinar. Um, what we are seeing here is that small and medium-sized business owners uh, make up a large part of the cybercrime reporting to this bureau, uh, which we subsequently investigate. So it's important for us to be able to explain to your members uh, what we do, where they can find us. And we'll talk about later on what we're seeing and how you can protect yourself against uh, the different threats out there. So I suppose my job as the head of the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau is to ensure that Garda Siakana has the capability and the capacity uh, to fully investigate cybercrime offence that happen within this jurisdiction. Uh, unfortunately, cybercrime is not anything like the type of crime, what I would call traditional crime, that we have seen for the last hundred years of our existence as, as an organisation. And for the next hundred years, we are rapidly moving into uh, cyber crime, both cyber enabled crime and cyber dependent crime. I'm joined here this morning with my colleague, Detective Superintendent Pat Ryan. Pat is in charge of operations here at the Bureau. And Pat will give you an overview of um, how extensive cyber crime is in, in as far as what we are seeing through reports. Um, he will also maybe give you a couple of examples of the type of cyber crime uh, that's happening out there and a little bit uh, in conjunction with your other uh, commentators on how businesses can protect themselves against cyber crime. Um, but make no mistake about it, protection is by far the, the, the easiest route because they are very complex once they have to be investigated. They are very technically challenging um, from an investigating point of view. And because cybercrime knows no borders and because a lot of these crimes are emanating from outside the jurisdiction, attribution, which is a lot of what law enforcement is about, can be challenging. Uh, now, we do work very closely with our international law enforcement partners uh, and we do leverage that network very well. And we do uh, work very well in collaborative efforts and investigations, a lot of which are ongoing and we'll touch on them. Uh, but really, uh, we would always say to people to look on cybersecurity as an investment, not an overhead. And, you know, I won't go as strong as say, you know, prepare for the inevitable, but there is a good chance that there will at least be an attempt on your business. So you have to ensure that you have your uh, policies in place, that you have your practice exercises in place, uh, and you have your procedure documents, and you know all your digital entities within your ecosystem. And as Jackie said earlier, you're aware of the potential insider threat. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, I know my colleague Pat Ryan is here. Pat, do you want to add anything into that? Um, I suppose no, just to say good morning to everybody, first of all. Um, as my, my chief has outlined there, um, we, I suppose the last year and a half has, has seen a lot of changes in the cybercrime landscape. And I suppose that's a lot of that is due to the way we work as a result of the COVID pandemic with a lot of people now working from home and even continuing to work from home. Uh, so look, we will get into some of the questions afterwards and I'll, I'll be able to answer in a little bit more detail. So good morning, everybody. That's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's great, Pat. Um, <clears throat> and I, actually just 
in the in the nature of the questions as we have, I, I think the first questions are probably going to be most uh, relevant um, to you, just in terms of the, the questions that have generally come in to us about defining cyber crime, uh, how extensive it is, and uh, our, our thing is is hacking a, a cyber crime, blackmail, and, and ransom are, are, are they sort of connected? So. Could you define from from your investigation and uh, detection point of view what what it is as 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 a crime and how big is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so, um, I suppose when you talk about defining cybercrime, uh, I don't think there's any universally agreed definition of the term cybercrime. Uh, there's hundreds of definitions out there, but it commonly refers to a broad range of different criminal activities where computers and information systems are involved either as a primary tool or as a primary target. Uh, in Ireland, we classify cybercrime by how a computer or ICT is used in the commission of the offence. Uh, and we generally break it down into two cybercrime categories, which are cyber-enabled crime and cyber-dependent crime. So when we talk about cyber-enabled crime, we're generally talking about traditional offences, such as fraud, forgery, uh, identity theft, content-related offences, such as online distribution of child uh, abuse images or incitement to racial hatred, uh, and all facilitated by the use of computers and ICT. So that's cyber-enabled crime. Uh, our work here in the Garda National Cyber Crime Bureau, when it comes to cyber-enabled crime, involves providing top-tier digital forensics to our investigators and districts in, 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 around the country. So we, we, we will basically take the devices seized during cyber-enabled crime investigations, uh, we will decrypt them and we will retrieve from those devices the evidence required for a prosecution in court by the investigators. When it comes to cyber-dependent crime, the, the second category of cyber-crime, cyber-dependent crime uh, are offences unique to computers uh, and information systems, um, such as DDoS attacks, um, denial of service, uh, malware, ransomware, and these are cyber crimes in which you need computers and ITC in order to carry them out. Uh, here at the Garda National Cyber Crime Bureau, we are proactive in this regard, and we are the unit within the Garda organisation which uh, fully investigates these crime. And we do that, as I said earlier, with our international collaborative partners. So in, in a sense, that's a broad definition of cyber crime and the two categories that it's broken down into. Um, as regards how extensive it is, Pat, do you want to take that? Okay, I suppose I just want to leave there. I suppose the last year, you know, has seen the number of cyber attacks grow significantly with cyber dependent crimes such as ransomware, data interference increased by over 150% on the same period last year. So at the same time, um, cyber enabled crimes such as phishing, business email compromise have increased by almost 40%. So there, there has been a huge increase. I suppose, on the number of cyber incidents uh, reported to Angarda Síochána over the last uh, year um, compared to this time last year. So I suppose just in relation to is, you know, hacking a, a cyber crime. Well, the Criminal Justice uh, Act offences relating to information systems 2017 provides for offences uh, relating to, you know, accessing information systems without lawful authority, interference with information systems without lawful authority, interference with data without lawful authority and interception, intercepting transmissions uh, of data without lawful authority. And I suppose it also covers the use of computer programs, passwords, codes, or data for any of the above offenses as well. So the legislation is there in relation to uh, cybercrime. And you know this was a result of, um, I suppose, Ireland signing up to the Budapest Convention where we are, you know, that has been ratified at the moment. And this was one of the, the major pieces of legislation to be brought in under, under that. Um, I know it was mentioned there as well as blackmail and uh, ransomware connected. Well, I suppose just to answer that briefly, I suppose ransomware focuses on, on businesses to, to pay up for decryption keys for the return of stolen data. Uh, what is common now is what's known as, I suppose, the double extortion, whereby if victims don't pay up, the criminals will further make demands and threaten uh, publication of uh, company data. Does that answer your question? That's great, Pat. Um, and, and Paul, thank you. I, uh, 
One, from, one other aspect of that uh, I would like to, especially in view of the HSE uh, hack this year, that the perception is that most of this comes from abroad and, and possibly from the rogue actor states. Is it, you know, is, is it, is cybercrime exclusively or mainly originating abroad or is there any of it taking place? To, uh, have we domestic actors as well? No, no, we, we do definitely have um, domestic actors. And for example, you know, even up to yesterday, we had a suspect plead guilty in Cork Circuit Court um, for a hacking, a number of hacking offences. So, you know, <clears throat> we would be confident here in the Guard National Cybercrime Bureau that if there are threat actors operating within this jurisdiction, uh, that we would certainly be very proactive. And every week of every month, we have ongoing investigations, court cases, arrests. Um, they generally tend to be at a lower level. And with the organised cyber criminal gangs, they would be based internationally, generally in countries <clears throat> which would um, not be as uh, cooperative, we say, in collaborative investigations. So that can be a challenge for us. The whole evolving regulatory uh, system around access to and retention of data is a huge problem for us. And I suppose, you know, we're all very conscious of the right to privacy of people online, and, that, and that's very important. But we have to balance that where um, cybercrime criminals and terrorists and child abusers are using this anonymity that the internet affords them to carry out their heinous crimes. So we have to try and balance the rights of privacy with. Uh, you know, our role in protecting the vulnerable and keeping people safe. So it's a constant challenge, but I suppose to go back to your question, um, with the more organised cybercrime activities, you will generally find that they are international gangs based uh, abroad. Uh, but however, uh, it is happening daily and weekly here. And um, we see a lot of the, the homegrown cybercrime, uh, Jackie mentioned, insider threat. That would be a huge feature that we would see with, you know, uh, contractors, consultants, people who have left organisations, people who are still within organisations with a group. Um, those are the type of threat actors locally that we're seeing that people would really want to be prepared for. That's great, Paul, thanks. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a, a lot of quite technical questions now, so I'm going to just field these at the people I think may uh, be best able to answer them, but if not, I'm, I'm sure someone else can hop in. The first one, I, I'm, Brian, is to, to describe the kind of qualitative difference in, in uh, um, uh, placed against small businesses as against larger businesses. And is, is it just a difference in the resources that are aimed at those businesses? Maybe you could have a go at that, Brian. Yeah, I suppose, you know, cyber criminals in, in many ways uh, target organizations either A, because they feel that organization may have something they're worth going after. So uh, if, the, if they feel an organization has a lot of personal data, maybe credit card information or financial information, uh, they would target those companies based on that. And typically they can be the larger organizations and, you know, uh, there, there's the uh, famous, uh, I can't remember the guy's uh, name right now, but he's a famous bank robber back in the 1930s in the U.S. And when he was eventually uh, arrested uh, by the uh, U.S. authorities, he was asked by a newspaper reporter, hey, Willie, why do you rob banks? And the answer was, "That's because that's where the money is. Uh, I think if we look today at the cyber criminals today, is ask them, why do you hack into companies? And their, their answer is going to be, that's where the data is because data has a lot of value, has value. Uh, on the underground black markets, our personal information can be traded, be, be traded from anything from five to $15 per record. Uh, and that's down to information such, such as your name, your date of birth, your address, your favorite uh, car, your favorite football team, your place of birth, all the information that criminals can use to, to target you more specifically for later scams or to, to, to try and hijack your identity. Of course, there's, so there's credit card money, credit card data, there, there's banking information. And Jackie mentioned in her intro as well, that for many companies, there will be intellectual property. So if you're doing research or you're, you're, you're working with Donna's team or whatever, and you're, you're about to invent the next, next Facebook <coughs> or, or the next Microsoft or the next Moderna, uh, that data, if that's got, got stolen by a competitor, that's your business gone. 
Okrimas can also be uh, uh, speculative. They, you know, just like in, in the real world, uh, you've got organized gangs who will target banks, etc., to rob them because they have the resources, but they'll also target and mug uh, individuals, uh, unsuspecting individuals out there. And, and in the online world, that can happen to many SMEs as well. You can just, you know, the, for criminals, it's very cheap and easy to send out loads of emails with links in them or attachments that can contain uh, malicious uh, content such as malware or to to try and and, and harvest credentials, etc. It's it, it's very cheap. You can send thousands of emails out. It's relatively cheap. You can scan thousands of computers in minutes and look for any computers or systems that, that are vulnerable and then attack them. So you could just be unlucky as well in that uh, it could, you could be just, just random. And very often, you know, we, we mentioned ransomware and uh, people have often asked me, well, why would criminals target an SME with ransomware? Uh, our information doesn't really wouldn't really attract a criminal. You know, we don't have a whole lot of information. They're not after your information as such. They're after denying you access to your systems. They're after, they're looking to disrupt your business so much so that you're willing to pay money to get your business back 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 operating again. Uh, so at the heart of it all, criminals want to make money, and that's what they want to do. And uh, as in the cyber world, as in the real world, if we take basic steps um, uh, uh, to raise the cost of attacking you or, or, or make it more difficult to attack you, they're more, more likely to move on uh, so, somewhere else. So uh, okay. uh, that, that's where I think a lot of it would be near you. That's great. Thanks, Brian. Um, um, I, I, I think Jackie might be best uh, pitched to, to answer this one, but uh, Brian earlier uh, mentioned two-factor authentication um, as an additional layer of security. But, but even among those businesses that do uh, have that, including ours, um, we're wondering, is there a cost-effective way of assisting um, workplace colleagues to identify uh, scam or phishing emails uh, before they click on, on a link or act, act, act on an email? And uh, are, other, other than two-factor authentication, Jackie, is there anything else we can do to improve our email security? Um, multi-factor authentication um, generally blocks other people getting into your email. Um, and I say generally because there are ways around it, but, but for the most part, it will block people getting in. But will it, uh, once somebody is into your email, like your, your own employees that you've legitimately allowed into your email, if there's some kind of a link or a, a scam email that they've got in, multi-factor authentication is not going to protect them from clicking a link um, and going out. To, you know, to either download malware or go to um, an illegitimate site um, or do the things that those links will sometimes bring you to do. And often those links start asking you questions and, you know, saying, oh, you know, kind of you need to re-log in again, stealing your credentials. And yes, they might have difficulties logging back in because they don't have multi-factor authentication, but it's not a it's it's a good control, but it's not kind of going to cover you for everything. Um, so really, the best thing you can do uh, to try and protect that is training, um, you know, training people over and over again and frequently uh, to make sure that they're aware and they can spot the types of um, scams that, that are, are going to come into them and be directed at them. Um, and there are lots of, you know, you don't have to rewrite that training. There are lots of online training facilities, lots of free facilities even that you can point your staff at um, and testing them, you know, kind of uh, over and over again and seeing do people get kind of caught out. And if, you know, typically you find that, you know, if you start off training people on, on email awareness, maybe about 30% of people will fail some of the initial tests that you put in and you should be able to get that down to about 10%. And then at that point, there's a 10% that you really have to focus on and, and kind of work hard with them to get them to, to, to look and understand what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. Um, the other thing is to make sure that you have a policy of reporting and that there's a no fault or no blame reporting policy in your organization because people aren't going to tell you what they've done if they're going to be kind of held up as a prior, uh, you know, when, when something goes wrong. That's great, Jackie. Thanks very much. Um, Donna, if I could, if I could ask you, um, and, uh, this is a question more about a, an obviously an established uh, business, but 
what what your opinion on uh, the importance of ISO certification or equivalent um, for data protection? Um, what what do you think of the value of those for SMEs? Yeah, uh, ISO basically is a international standard for managing your information security, um, and there are other standards as well for you know complementary standards out there for for managing your information as well, such as GDPR. Um, and there are other ones as well related to uh, protection of health data. So there are a whole range of standards out there for protection of different types of data. Um, obviously, um, being um, ISO 27001, it, compliance for a very large organization is incredibly important and it's very valuable and it gives people the assurance of that the information is properly managed, um, the backup and recoveries are actually there, that are complying to all the regulation standards and, and, and risk. Um, the, the, the challenge at the moment is, and this is the challenge that SMEs actually have in particular, is that there are a whole host of standards out there, um, and it's a very complicated landscape to actually navigate. And in addition to that, there are an increased um, number of regulation and compliance requirements that are coming down to industries, mandatory um, increased uh, compliance and regulation, such as the NIST 2 directive. So if you're actually a small manufacturing company, um, you now have increased compliance um, requirements under NIST 2. Um, and this is very onerous for companies to actually manage. So um, obviously these standards are incredibly important. They've been designed by the, some of the best experts in the world. Um, we should be complying to them. But it's a very, very difficult landscape for SMEs to operate in because there are so many of them out there. And I think that's the problem that SMEs actually have. That's great, Donna. Thanks very much. Um, coming around to you, Brian, again, could I ask you just uh, very briefly to, to tell us a little bit about, we get a lot of offers for it at the moment, um, cyber insurance. Uh, a lot of providers, you know, what is best to insure? How much, you know, how much should we be paying? Is is are a lot of the products out there, you know, are they are they worth having? Uh, just general cyber insurance. Uh, 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 my my first thing I would say is that uh, if, if you had money and your choice was to invest it in uh, improving your defensive systems, your, your cyber security are spent on cyber security uh, on cyber insurance. Uh, my answer would be you're better off uh, spending that money on, as Jackie pointed out, training staff, uh, buying the appropriate systems to put in place. Insurance, cyber insurance, like every other type of insurance, uh, it, it's there to cover costs in the event of uh, uh, a cyber attack happening. You know, uh, it's not going to prevent the cyber attack. What, what some cyber insurance will do is that they will require you to have certain things in place anyway before they even give you a quotation uh, uh, or even insure you. So uh, it, it, I'm sure as many owners here have gone, if, if you're getting insurance for your building, you're often asked a lot of questions in, 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 in the in, 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 in the form for applying for insurance, you ask questions about have you got fire alarms installed or what, what quality are those fire alarms? Have you got locks on your doors and locks on your windows? Going for cyber insurance, you're, you're very much asked the same questions. And if you don't have those things in place, you're not going to get insurance or you're going to be paying a very high premium. And uh, with all due respect to anybody from the insurance business on the, on, on the webinar this morning, any of us who've, who have who've had experience of trying to claim against an insurance policy, be that for your car insurance, home insurance or business, you very often you don't get the money you're, you're hoping or expecting to get under the premium. So I would say cyber insurance can be a good tool to uh, help you focus your mind uh, on what you need to put in place to, to make your business more secure. Uh, I would not be relying on cyber insurance solely as, as a mean. And, and I do have a worry that, you know, there are lots of ad, adverts and sales out there talking about cyber insurance and it's, 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 it comes across this uh, uh, silver bullet. But like if, if your car gets, uh, gets stolen, then it's, tomorrow morning, you still have the inconvenience of having no car and having to, 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 to replace it and get your claim at the same time. Same way if you have a cyber attack, you still have the inconvenience of your business being disrupted, data being lost, having to call on Gardaí, Shikana, et cetera, uh, and you may get some coverage of, of the insurance as well. Uh, just coming on to one thing that Donna mentioned about standards as well, there is a standard in the UK called Cyber Essentials, 
uh, which is used by the UK to target businesses that look to provide services to the UK government. And uh, it actually is uh, quite quite good in, in covering the, the basics required. And if anybody is looking to see is there a way for them to prove their own business to their customers is, is uh, uh, at a certain level of security or maturity, uh, cyber essentials is, is a good first step uh, in getting there. And it's much more cost effective than going the full blown ISO 27,000 month, which will be, if you like, a, a much higher, a much better regarded standard, but obviously more difficult to get as well. Great, Brian. Thanks very much. And actually, that segues into a question I was going to put uh, to Jackie, which is um, a, a lot of small businesses really don't know where to start. Uh, so the, the topic is just so big uh, in terms of cybersecurity. They don't know where to start, don't know where to look. Uh, Brian's mentioned UK Cyber Essentials. Um, is there a, is there an Irish equivalent, and if there isn't, should we be developing one? And is is there any sort of affordable? If this isn't too broad a question, I'm not. I, I we obviously need to kind of keep this uh, bite size. Is there an affordable framework for SMEs to get to a minimum uh, standard? Um. Well. I agree that Cyber Essentials is actually, uh, you know, very good and it's as applicable here as, as it is, uh, you know, in any other country. So I, I think it's a great kind of framework to look at. Um, but I, I would boil it down very quickly to organizations, um, as I mentioned in the start, to actually know and understand their assets, to be familiar with what it is that they're trying to protect in their business um, and to put protection around those and then to try and monitor, you know, whether that protection is working or not in some way. Um, that's in a nutshell what you're trying to do with cybersecurity. Um, and and um, some of the basics in that are making sure that uh, you've got backups in place um, and making sure that you um, have the ability to build your systems back up again if something goes wrong, you know, so that you actually understand and maybe do a couple of equivalent to fire drills in the business, like, you know, in your, in your building of, you know, well, if that disappeared in the morning, what would I do? Would I go back to some kind of manual process or would I um, have the ability to get that backup that I've hopefully kept offline and not connected to my systems that might get attacked? Um, and how, can I get that back in again and can I make it work? Um, like a lot of people in a situation where they get some kind of catastrophic attack um, move to the cloud quite quickly if they've had a lot of their stuff on prem because it's it's a you know a faster way of kind of reconstituting yourself the uh, um so i i would say ha have some plans in place about what you would do if you were hit um and try to work those through in such a way that you're thinking well actually if i had had this in place um it it, it may have made a difference and you know even getting three or four hours of a cybersecurity consultant's time to come in and talk to you in your business is a very worthwhile investment. Like, you know, like typically now when we'd be working with people, you could be there for months actually trying to work through putting new systems and new controls and help them identify risks. But literally even three or four hours talking to somebody rather than trying to reinvent the wheel yourself uh, could give you a nice plan of, you know, I should, if I do these five things, I'm going to be in, in a safer situation. Great, Jackie. Thanks very much. Um, I'm. <laughs> does actually just add to that, Neil, please. Yes. Who, who's that? Sorry. What Jackie said there is, is very, very relevant indeed. Um, and I suppose the, the one of the key things um, is to have that, you know, inc incident response plan ready, um, and you know, to have one prepared. Um, the one thing that you know, I've seen in my time here at the Bureau is that a lot of companies do have that incident response plan. However, it's left up on the shelf. It's not basically taken down unless it's needed and then it's out of date. So really it's to have that incident response plan and know exactly who is responsible for what in the event that you are subject to a cyber incident. Uh, and the one thing I would also advise is to have on Garda Síochána as part of that plan as well, uh, work here, um, to provide advice and assist in the event that you are subject to a cyber incident. And I know that uh, someone I think has just posted it there, but we work very closely with the National Cyber Security Centre as well, and they have some excellent advices as well on their website. Uh, they also have a um, an excellent guide there for cyber security for businesses, and it's a 12-step steps to cyber 
security for businesses. And this basically provides a kind of a 12 month strategic plan uh, for cyber security. So I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. That's great, Pat. Thanks very much. And, and actually, the next uh, one is, is also one, I think, for, for the guy, for Pat or Paul, um, in, in terms of the existing uh, provisions, uh, legislative or, or in terms of uh, for the detection of cyber crime and cybersecurity, do, do you believe that we need to en enhance legislation or anything else? Are we are, are, are we where we should be uh, relative to our peer countries or do, do you see any gaps that, that we need to fill uh, uh, in law or, or otherwise? Thanks, Neil. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we, we do have the Criminal Justice uh, Offences Related to Information Systems Act, and you know it's a very good piece of legislation. As the Chief had mentioned earlier, we, we had um, a case yesterday where someone was actually uh, convicted under this particular legislation uh, for access to information systems without lawful authority. So it's a very powerful piece of legislation that we have. I suppose one of the one of the key um, issues that has you know that we have seen in this jurisdiction is the whole area of uh, reporting or underreporting. I should say, uh, this this is a huge challenge uh, for Angara Shikana and. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we fully understand that when it comes to a cyber incident that, you know, sometimes the company may not want this to be reported for, uh, for various different reasons. However, as I said earlier, you know, help is available and that's what we're here to do. We're here to assist when it comes and advise. And I suppose the other element of it is there, the Criminal Justice Act uh, 2011 under Section 19, uh, there is an offence there, you know, uh, and just in relation to uh, if a person uh, basically is, you know, and I'll read it out to you, a person should be guilty of an offence if he or she has information which he, he or she knows or believes might be of material assistance in preventing the commission by another person of a relevant offence or uh, securing the apprehension, prosecution uh, or conviction of other persons for a relevant offence. So basically, and fails with a reasonable excuse to disclose that information as soon as practical to do so to a member of Hungary Shikana. We do get plenty of Section 19 reports in here. And, you know, I would ask that, uh, you know, if you are subject to um, a, a cyber crime, that you would report it to Hungary Shikana. And I suppose this has, there's a number of reasons for this. One, we, we, we better understand the cyber crime landscape within this jurisdiction. But two, for us to also to be able to provide advices to our other partners and to the public uh, generally in relation to the latest cyber threats within this jurisdiction. Okay, thanks, Pat. If I can just uh, add on to what Pat just said there, Neil, a lot of times when we get called by SMEs who've been uh, hacked or suffer from cybercrime, and we recommend you go for them to go and talk to Angarda Shikana, the reaction often has been, with all due respect to Pat and Paul, is why should we? bother you know uh, we just want the systems to get back up and running we don't want to waste time or get get bogged down by being involved in, in it and anyway what can the guards do uh, they're not going to get the person behind this this particular attack and i just want to throw in there that we we're as a nation we're, we're actually very very lucky uh paul pat and their colleagues are probably one of the top uh team in in europe i have spent four years as a special advisor to, to, to Europol on, uh, on, on cybercrime and the respect internationally out there for uh, our colleagues in Angarda Shikana is very, very high. So we are very lucky. Uh, but yes, as with all crime, you report to Angarda Shikana, be that your bike gets stolen, doesn't necessarily mean Angarda you're going to get the individual who may have stolen your bike straight away. But the, as Pat pointed out there, any information they get from your cybercrime that will have a lot of information uh, that could potentially point back to the criminals behind this. And Angarda Shikana will share that with their partners, such as Europol, who have analysts and agents who, who analyze and, and gather all that intelligence and working with Europol and other police forces will eventually create a jigsaw puzzle out of all the pieces they get from all the cyber crime around, around Europe to form a picture of who's behind this, these crimes. And eventually those people will be brought to jail. So please don't think, oh, uh, it's not worth my while con contacting Angarda Shikana. 
uh, be, you know, uh, please do. Uh, they are a very excellent and professional bunch of, of people who, who will help you. Best time to contact them actually is probably straight after this call. To you know, you know go to your, lo your local Garda station, contact the relevant uh, people in that Garda station to establish a relationship so that when something does go wrong, you have a relationship to build on. And they, you'll probably get a lot of good information on prevention of cybercrime as well, which, you know, as we all know, prevention is better than the cure. So uh, sorry to cut across you, Neil, and, and interrupt. Okay. But it was important to add there that reporting stuff to Angarda Shikana is, is very, very important because it does help us get these people who are at an international level behind us. Okay. Neil, can I just add to that? Okay. Um, Thanks, Brian, for that. Th thanks very much. Uh, just in relation to Neil uh, inviting people to go and make contact with the, the, the guards, the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau has recently commenced operations at hubs around the country, and we have one in Cork, Galway, Mullingar, and Wexford. So if those uh, stations are within your region, you can reach out directly to the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau uh, teams in each of those stations, the closest one to you, or you can contact us here at gnccb at garda.ie. Uh, and as Pat said earlier, um, we're, we're here to help and to assist. Obviously, our, you know, as being law enforcement, we're always looking at that attribution angle. But if it's the case that you're telling us, look, I don't want to go down that line, well, then we're quite happy to work with you to get that intelligence from you to try and protect other people. Uh, with other small and medium sized businesses. So thanks for that. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. And obviously there's there's quite a bit of detail given out there. I should um I should emphasize at this point that the, this uh, is a recorded um session so you will be able to look back at is, is of interest to you. Um a, a slightly uh technical or or some would say a slightly geeky query here but i'm gonna ask um donna uh, because we do we we do have a lot of people interested um in terms of investments here on on two fronts um a talking about <clears throat> the movement to cloud-based systems and are they easier to secure uh, than than in-house systems or or uh, an in-house server, and there's allied to that as a question um, <clears throat> about Apple devices, uh, whether they're easier or harder to to hack into. Um, but I, I I think why the, the base of that question isn't just around iPhones. I think it's the fact that is. Uh, advertising and marketing very heavily now into the commercial and business space where they weren't before. So perhaps Donna, and if it's not your area, maybe we'll field it somewhere else, but the cloud, cloud-based and Apple systems. Yeah, <clears throat> that's no problem. I can talk about the Apple devices um, first. So basically there are two types of um, uh, operating systems for phones. Generally, it's the, it's the iPhone, which is an iOS, or an Android. And the iPhone came out in 2007, and Android came out in 2008. Um, and Android has a massive global footprint. It has about 80% of all of the global mobile market, representing billions of smartphones and mobile devices. Um, and um, iOS users um, who haven't jailbroken their phones, so who have actually a legitimate piece of software are actually quite well protected because of Apple's tightly controlled ecosystem. Um, and so for a non jailbroken iOS user, basically in order to install an app, it's actually quite difficult, right? Because you can't actually develop an app without actually going through a process with Apple. Um, so in order to do this, you'd have to get an enterprise developer certificate from Apple, you'd have to build their app, you'd have to sign it with a certificate, and then you'd have to, if you were a cyber criminal, you'd have to distribute it to um, actually your potential victims and convince them to install it. And this is a very difficult scenario for cyber criminals because, you know, it's actually very complicated and, you know, they have very, very little room to maneuver um, and the payoff could be quite low. Um, the difference with 
Android is that it's actually a very open system um, and the open system needs innovation. So there are advantages to having it very open. Um, but because it's open and permissive, uh, cyber criminals can develop their own apps and put it up in the app store and it can be downloaded on the phone much easier. And that's the difference really between the two platforms in terms of security. It doesn't make Apple devices, you know, or iOS devices um, in, impenetrable to security attacks because there are a whole host of uh, uh, supply chain attacks, you know, like the, actually you can see from the um, from the solar wind attacks, you know, you could actually um, attack in a different way or you could attack via a WhatsApp um, software or whatever it is. It, it's just the, the, the ability to actually um, get a piece of malware installed and the, the actual piece of software is much more difficult for cyber criminals and um, iOS type devices. Um, in relation to the second question, which is about cloud-based systems, I mean, cloud-based systems is basically a virtualization platform, um, but you still have to implement and, and customize your security requirements on it. And, um, you know, and, and that basically involves, you know, you need to do your backup of your data, you need to secure the devices and the network with by installing your virtual permissions and, 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 and implementing your policies, you need to you know, basically tell the virtualized platform that you want to encrypt um, important information. You know, you need to still set up multi-factor authentication. You need to manage past phases. You need to monitor the equipment and the systems and you need to put all your policies in place and you need to train the staff. So, you know, the, the cloud-based systems basically allows you to spin up very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, but you still have to implement all the security features around it. And you're not just going to, spin up a virtualized platform and say, hey, presto, there, there it is. Um, there is. There are other parts that you have to do to actually get it secure as well. But it, in terms of security, um, you know, if you have the policies and procedures in place, then you know, is it as good as a, an enterprise system? Well, it, it can be, and that's the, the reality of it. The enterprise system, you know, you can lock it up and you have more physical security around it, but you know, you may not have the policies or procedures to actually protect it virtually. So that's that's really okay. the reality of it. Thanks, Donna. Um, this is a question that I, I very much I empathize with, and, and perhaps um, Jackie would be best to, to deal with this one. Um, it, the, the question is about getting, uh, for a business, getting overall insurance assurance in a, in a multi-software vendor environment. I suppose I would add a, a little bit to that and say, it, it, with many, uh, it is very difficult for, for SME owners and managers who lack uh, IT expertise to choose. Uh, so how, how would you... Um, how would you approach making almost making the purchase decision for a small business? Um, well, the first thing is safety in numbers is, is kind of not such a bad thing, typically. Um, uh, if, if a product is, is well utilized and reputable and you know other people that are using it, um, uh, that's good. Uh, like the reality is, is when you're when you're purchasing things, you're looking as much at the functionality as the security. People often forget the security. So, uh, you know, asking the question about the security is very good. Um, now, uh, you know, kind of a, I would view that taking something on prem for a small business is probably more of a challenge, actually, than taking something in the cloud. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to. Um, not think about the security controls in the cloud that they're all done for you but if you're up with the application there and you're using what we refer to as software as a service an awful lot of the security is actually already in place um, like things like data theft and um, denial of service monitoring and that sort of thing are pretty much there by standard on most cloud-based applications. The, uh, whereas um, things like the minor configuration changes or you know, some of the optional pieces, uh, you know, if, if you get someone to give you some advice when you're, when you're installing it, then you're, you're probably going to be fairly safe. So I think as a small kind of medium enterprise, um, having cloud-based kind of applications is actually a good idea. They're automatically patched for you. There's a whole load of things that you don't need to worry about. Um, whereas if you're actually managing something on premise, you actually do need to bring the system down, patch it, you need to back it up yourself, you need to do all those things yourself, which are quite complicated. Um, but from a point of view, the other aspect of assurance that we often get asked about is, is the supply chain aspect. And previously, you would say, you know, if you're going for something that's fairly, you know, out of the box, you know, that you've just bought it, you're going to be fairly safe. 
Now, Donna referred to the solar winds incident um, that happened earlier in the year where we saw that the supply chain of actually reputable software companies had been infiltrated. Um, so that does leave that a little bit into question. Um, but in general, uh, you know, rather than developing something yourself, you probably are safer to buy something out of the box. Um, if you develop it yourself, you have to do an awful lot of assurance to make sure that it's not riddled with bugs um, and a lot of testing. And why not utilize something that's been done by a lot of other people before you? I don't know. Does that help, Neil? OK, uh, no, that's that's very good, Jackie. I'm afraid we've with um, with just I think we have three minutes to go. I, well, I still have quite a lot of questions. A lot of people <laughs> didn't get them in. Um, if I could just ask for uh, just the panel for a really short wrap, and I mean, you know, 30, 40 seconds, because there are some people we didn't get, uh, some people's questions we didn't get to answer. So perhaps I'm, I'm going to uh, suggest that I go through the panel in, in the order. And by the way, you're still seeing some stuff uh, coming up in the chat window there. Um, could I, uh, conscious that we, we did promise everyone we, we'd wrap at nine, could I ask for a really fast wrap, just starting with Jackie, please? Sure. Um, for me, it's know and understand your assets, um, protect them with whatever you can afford to protect them with, and uh, make sure that you have incident response plans in place and that you know the people that you're going to need uh, in the event that you have an incident. For example, on Garda Shikana that you've thought about, are you transferring risk to insurance and all those sort of things. So make your plans and try and stick with them. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jackie. Uh, Brian, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Neil. I would say, reiterate, you know, uh, this is a business risk, so treat it as such, uh, same as any other risk to your business. Uh, keep your systems patched, updated, uh, and deploy good antivirus software. Uh, as Jackie says, use the, use the cloud where you can. And uh, I would recommend going to those guides provided by ANISA and the National Cybersecurity Center. There, there's a lot of good information there that is, is free. And a lot of the stuff you need to deploy doesn't need to cost a lot of money either. So uh, Great. Thanks, Brian. Donna? Yeah, I think really, um, I would say invest in people um, and invest in your skills. Um, a comment was made by a, a company to me recently. Um, what if I invest in, in the person and they leave? And a comment was made back by my team. Well. What if you don't invest in the person and they stay? Um, and I think really, you know, that's the, the message I would deliver. The investment in people and the investment in skills is the best line a company's defense can have. And I would say if I was going to invest in anything, that would be my advice to companies. Thank you very much, Donna. I, I'm actually going to leave Paul to do the final wrap. So I'll, I'll come to take Pat out of order and ask him to go next. Yeah, I suppose the, one of the key messages from, from the Cybercrime Bureau, I think definitely, look, you need to be prepared. Um, it's not a matter of if, it's probably a matter of when. So have that incident you know, response plan, uh, conduct regular exercises. And I think the key message for me is help is available uh, if you need it. Thanks very much, Pat. And, and finally, to wrap, if we can have the, the head of the uh, National Cybercrime Bureau, uh, Paul. Yeah, I just want to add um, to what Pat has said there. Um, I suppose being selfish about it, I, I, I would like all of the, the, the participants this morning to know that the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau are an asset that they can leverage. Um, I want us to be part of their network and I want people to reach out, even if it's only for advice. Um, I have mentioned that we have cyber hubs around the country in Cork, Galway, Lim Mullingar and uh, Wexford. But in addition to that, we've recently trained 200 guards in every district in the country uh, to deal with uh, any cyber crime that may be reported locally to a station. So help is there from law enforcement. So please do use it, uh, even if it's only for advice. And, you know, don't be feeling that you have to go down the line of attribution if you don't want to. Um, so we're there. So the websites that I would ask you to visit is garda.ie forward slash cybercrime um, and gnccb at garda.ie. You'll get all the information you need between those two sites. Uh, anything else, uh, you can get us on an email or a phone call. Thanks very much uh, to ISMI and uh, thanks for being very proactive during October's uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Thanks very much, Paul. And uh, it, 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 um, it's just for me to very finally wrap. I, we're actually a minute over time, and my apologies. Um, 
on, on behalf of our speakers, uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Curry, uh, Detective Superintendent Pat Ryan uh, from Angarda Shia Kona, um, uh, Jackie Fox, MD of Accenture, Brian Honan of BH uh, Consulting, and uh, Don O'Shea from uh, Munster Technical University. Thank you very much, all. We, we do have a recording of this available for, uh, for you to subsequently download if you want it. And I, I suspect this is probably an area we will come back to in the new year because I, I think an awful lot of small businesses are un unfortunately getting it at the um, not on a on a proactive uh, basis. I will put my hands up as, as a representative of the business and say, especially to the Gardaí, that unfortunately a lot of SMEs tend to be reactive and they come to you after the problem uh, rather than uh, you know, buying the fire extinguisher after down, but uh, we don't we don't want to be there, and that's the whole reason uh, we're we're running an event like this, and we probably will do it then. So, ladies and gentlemen, back to the day job. Thank you very much for your attendance, and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Bye now.